One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, welcome everyone to our October 10, 2023 Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District meeting. For our, and um, first item of agenda here is to call the meeting to order and pledge allegiance. Manager Burnett, you want to lead us in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. With liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right, our next item is to have any public comment from the public at this time. And I'm not seeing any public here at this time. So uh, we're going to move on to the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? Are there any changes <coughs> from staff? I don't believe there is. And I don't believe there's any changes from. Mm -mm. So um, I need a motion to approve the agenda. So second. second. Motion made by Manager Boyle, second by Manager Burnett. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried 5-0. Okay, so now we're going to go to old and new business and programs and project updates. Okay, I'll be starting the uh, staff Can I get you uh, to program and project that? update That's for the October 10th meeting here. Uh, we, the district continues to um, be within the severe drought category, and it has actually um, moved up into that extreme drought. This this uh, update doesn't um, reflect this last weekend's rain events, so we'll see how that might change the status. So this was as of October. Third. Nevertheless, um, this is a continuation um, of the summer drought and um, <coughs> resulting in low water. So, <laughs> I, the time I uh, projected uh, to work on this power, PowerPoint uh, happened to coincide with a, a site, our level site update. So. Fortunately, I don't have lake level um, uh, update status for us here tonight. Um, the lake has gone up slightly from uh, last month, and that was due to some needed rain here in the end of uh, September and early October. I've pulled the fish and pike lake loggers due to low water level. Um, we'll need to look into better locations for monitoring wells as they have um, the water is has moved away from the wells and so it, it's causing some um, strange water level uh, sort of tracking here um, in addition to, well so uh, in addition to the new website displaying the current water levels uh, we have also almost uploaded all the historic data sets um, onto this new website. So the historic data sets include um, the past three to five years for fish, pike, and spring lakes, and then the complete data set uh, dating back to the 19, uh, late 1930s for Prior Lake. So this will be um, searchable in the new website, and that'll be um, a, a great feature for uh, residents to look at and compare uh, current and past water levels. Moving on to carp management, <coughs> um, the carp are not taking bait at our Spring Lake hog trap, so um, we're going to continue just observing uh, that situation. Um, our, we've completed uh, three fall CPUE surveys, 
CPUE stands for Catch Per Unit Effort. It's a timed uh, sampling survey using electrofishing to gauge populations in our lakes. So we did that on fish, spring, and upper prior lakes for common carp population estimates. Um, during these uh, surveys, we installed the seven new radio tags in Spring Lake, making that a total of 11 active tags, and three new tags, radio tags in Upper Prior Lake, making that 10 to 12 active tags. There's a question um, around the exact number just because tags, batteries die, and um, that's why we're adding new ones. Right around 10 active tags is what we shoot for um, each year. So we're sitting well in our active radio tags. So later this week and next, staff will be conducting trap netting in Spring and Upper Prior Lakes to build on the population and recruitment data sets. So this trap netting will primarily focus on searching <coughs> for young of year carp. So Will the carp, did they, did they survive? Did they um, reproduce? Um, and that will help drive decision and management decisions for um, how we might stock bluegill, what sort of uh, traps and where we need barriers. So just a continuation of um, taking the, the right steps to make sure that we're doing the program correctly. And then the last, uh, carp management activity was that we uh, evaluated our carp barriers, the sort of historic low water level in our lakes right now have allowed us to review um, how the barriers are working. So many of these barriers were installed during normal water level uh, conditions. So right now we're, uh, we've found one barrier that needs repair. And it shouldn't be, you know, too much of a um, undertaking, but it's a, a good practice to keep up on our infrastructures. And then we have, um, so last month I think I updated the Starry Trek um, that there wasn't anything found, but, um, you know, some of those uh, confirmations take a little bit of time. So the latest report is that 10 new Chinese mystery snail infestations were found statewide, and that was largely uh, in result of volunteers uh, joining the Starry Trek event. Um, so the Chinese mystery snail was confirmed in Lower Prior Lake. So Chinese mystery snails similar to banded mystery snails, are regulated invasive species, which means that individuals can possess, transport, and buy uh, these, um, these species, but is illegal to introduce them to new water. So this is different than, say, Eurasian water milfoil or zebra mussels that are prohibited invasive species where it's illegal to possess, transport, and buy. So, you know, as a result of this um, infestation, it, it really, we don't have a, an action plan to take here. Um, they're, they're widely spread, as you can see in this South Metro map. Um, they're in many water bodies, so um, there's not a, a whole ton of information around their impact, but, but they are not from here. So something to keep an eye on. We'll continue, you know, doing our, our best to observe and educate the public on invasive species. And on the last bit here, uh, staff coordinated invasive species work such as buckthorn treatment on the Spring Lake parcel and along the Prior Lake Outlet Channel for woody invasives. Okay, 
I'll launch right into some project updates, some of which will be a brief review over what we discussed in the workshop. Uh, a couple uh, projects that have had updates in the last month, so I'll touch on a few more than, than normal. First wi of which being the Sutton Lake management plan, I just wanted to touch in because the follow-up and actions on this plan can seem passive when um, there's no capital project that's happening right now. Uh, but what came out of that plan is that we want to monitor the effect of the natural drought, which essentially s simulates uh, a drawdown and uh, evaluate it for its effectiveness to re-stimulate native plant diversity. So these are just some uh, drone images from a past survey. Uh, we'll be looking at doing a drone survey this fall. Uh, and the purpose of those is to really compare and see if we're seeing vegetation change uh, throughout the lake. It's a lake that's challenging to access, so uh, drone is a good option there. There'll nope, I got it, yep. Uh, okay, and then I also wanted to touch on the ferric chloride system assessment. I know in the uh, September meeting, we went over some options uh, to look at system updates and replacements, and I just wanted to outline when decisions are happening, uh, what kind of timeline we're at, and the goals. So these are kind of, I've kind of broken up. There's several tasks in this <laughs> a system assessment. So this first chunk, looking at the remaining life of the existing pieces, uh, making recommendations for what we might want to update or replace in those pieces, updating our operations manual and driveway assessment. I'm really kind of bucketing those in my brain as our goal here in these tasks is to maintain and replace the key system elements. These are things that will apply no matter what type of um, improvements we might make for efficiency and uh, really are just necessary to keep the operation going and safe. Uh, so those tasks are, are what you've seen coming forward first. And then the second bunch of tasks are really looking at how can we optimize the system? The effectives and alternatives analysis will actually be occurring next year because we had such low water level this year, we couldn't do the DAR testing that was necessary for that. Uh, so that study will look at, should we tweak our dosing rates to be more effective? Uh, are there hydraulic impacts we wanna address um, and make recommendations? That would be more at the weir and then uh, lower down in the system, so again, wouldn't affect those more basic key system elements. Uh, and then should we consider alternative chemicals? Uh, we'll need a tank for any chemical we decide. <laughs> so um, more just to point out that these things are coming and we can still move forward on the first um, basic updates uh, that are being looked at in the first uh, grouping of tasks. And lastly, with um, the full study, we'll have some anticipated permits and funding sources that could help support any uh, of these updates. So that second uh, group is really to assess, are there improvements we can make in our operation to make it ideal? Can we optimize it? Can we make a permit uh, and funding pathway for ourselves that is gonna um, be the best. And to give you an idea on timeline of an outcome and when we're thinking that that will turn into action, that first group of things, you saw a draft report in September. Uh, we're hoping to complete that section of the report this year um, with uh, acknowledgement of the feedback we got from you at the first meeting. Uh, the 2024 budget already includes the likely um, budget for those necessary updates. And the goal would be to make those decisions so that we can replace the necessary items to have a safe and operational system. None of those updates would hem us in um, and prevent us from changing our dosing or looking at a different chemical or uh, 
making uh, the hydraulic dynamics more effective. So really uh, more near-term updates that are necessary for operation. And then the second section, that'll be completed, as I mentioned, in 2024. Uh, just hoping we'll have water next year <laughs> to do that testing and inform that study. Uh, and then we'll bring that forward so you all can assess the options for improvement, see if there are any you want to pursue. Um, and then depending on what those recommendations are, we could seek funding or include in 2025 budget. We could even uh, consider a budget amendment in 2024. Uh, with that new information, uh, and then depending on the recommendations, those that span of how long it will take us to implement those changes, it could be as soon as next year or take longer to plan depending on the logistics there. So the goal with the second section is really to make sure that our system is optimized as possible and we're not missing a consideration that we should be uh, looking at. So to summarize, this first section is more like the basics, nuts and bolts, and then tweaking the system. Uh, so hopefully this help, helps you understand where the decision points are and that we'll come back with um, more information and, and then when we move forward. So we make sure that this really important project and program of ours is continuing to operate uh, safely and getting phosphorus out of, out of the water. So that's the goal. Uh, another project that updated on in the workshop is the Swamp Iron Enhanced Sand Filter. You all saw a draft feasibility study that presented three options, which would remove uh, 45 to 53 pounds of phosphorus annually. That is currently supported by a, a Bowser grant fund. And so we'll be looking at wrapping up edits to that and presenting a final feasibility study uh, by the end of the year. If the board has any further comments, please send those on to me. Uh, the goal of this project would be to reduce phosphorus coming out of Swamp Lake, uh, and some of the alternatives do have potential to reduce the peak flow, which would uh, improve the phosphorus removal here and potentially downstream uh, locations as well. This is just a summary Go ahead, Manager Deloney. Yeah, <clears throat> Emily, I was just thinking as you're looking at the cost of the phosphorus, and I know it was based on a 30-year uh, life, and I know on some of the other studies we've had like maybe 15 or 20-year life. It seems like we should be, get, be really consistent so that when we're comparing project to project, mm -hmm. we're comparing apples to apples. But I just started thinking about that because yeah. 30 years, spreads it out more, looks more attractive, where if it's 20 years, it wouldn't look as attractive. But anyway, mm -hmm. just a thought mm -hmm. to mention that to the con to yourself and uh, consultant. Yep. yep, we can address that. Some sites are designed to maximize the best uh, the site constraints, and so the lifetime can be predetermined for you. So I know some sites are more around 18 years, this one do 30 so the idea yeah that it might be bigger and last longer but you're gonna get more years benefit so good point so this table as you mentioned kind of summarizes uh, the information and the culmination being cost per pounds of phosphorus removed uh, in the middle there is kind of a driving apples to apples comparison with other phosphorus removal projects in the in the district Uh, another Bowser-funded project with support from Spring Lake Township is the Fish Lake Management Plan update, and we are presenting our initial findings and getting feedback on potential management strate strategies that would be included in the draft plan throughout the fall. Uh, we plan on presenting the draft plan to the board and uh, Spring Lake Township supervisors prior to next month's board meeting. Uh, so you'll be uh, receiving that, those recommendations. That'll include what we heard from residents at the landowner meeting, which occurred last uh, week. We did do a landowner survey and get some good feedback there. The, I won't present the full findings, 
Um, but just to give you a general summary of, of where things uh, tend to land, the, this kind of summarizes the relativity of where the phosphorus is coming from. We have phosphorus coming from outside of the lake in runoff, and we also have phosphorus that exists in the bottom sediments. So the graph on the left shows the phosphorus quantity in those bottom sediment, the bottom area, hypolimnium. Uh, and you can see those values are much higher, the highest around 1,200 micrograms per liter than what you would get in the surface water around 160. So it indicates, yep, there might be phosphorus coming from uh, many places that we need to address, uh, but the density is really um, in that bottom sediment. With that said, a long-term solution, what we're finding in the planning process is that Fish Lake will require both internal and external loading tools uh, to basically take care of the legacy loads that are sitting at the bottom of the lake and then prevent them from accumulating again. So the, these were pr presented at the landowner meeting uh, as potential management practices that the district could pursue to address both of those phosphorus sources. Uh, and we sought feedback on preferences and pros and cons of each of those. Uh, and we'll do that as well at the next meeting. <clears throat> um, lastly, I think the last project I have to update on is the Prior Lake Outlet Pipelining. As you heard in the workshop, there's a bonding, uh, House of Representatives bonding tour set for the afternoon of October 12th. Uh, we have the construction documents ready to demonstrate that we're shovel ready. And the diagram on the bottom right there is just showing the necessity of why we need to line this pipe. There's been a lot of development. It would be uh, almost impossible to dig it up and replace it at this point. So key piece of infrastructure, uh, and we'll be sure to emphasize that on Thursday. Any questions? Nope. Any questions for Emily or Jeff on their presentation? No, no questions? All right. Emily, you're still up. OK. The next item. The cost share program with Scott SWCD. Beautiful. And we'll just wait for it to load on all the screens. Great. So um, I'll be looking at the cost share policy document with all of the organizations that are on this slide um, this week to beginning that discussion. There's an annual <coughs> document renewal process where we talk about the policy and decide what's working and what needs to be tweaked. So I thought it was worthwhile to give a primer uh, before that conversation so we can all be on the same page if there are changes that come up out of that discussion. So I'll, I'll hope to give a brief uh, primer on what is it, how that money is spent, and how do we decide where to put that money. Cost share, in general, is an uh, incentive program to help landowners or, or renters uh, implement practices that would help the soil and water resources in our watershed district. Uh, and that incentive can be fl a flat rate, uh, $500 per acre, or it can be percent based on how much is spent. So these are just some pictures of types of practices that have been done or, and we incentivize lined waterway, grass waterways, a rain garden, and then uh, shoreline restoration, all providing different benefits to the watershed district. To give you an idea of how uh, the success we've had in the past in this program, the benefit of organizing the cost share program through this process with all of the different entities is that we really can share state funding and apply it where there's a project that's ready. So this graph on the left shows the dollars in thousands uh, that was spent by uh, us in the dark green uh, soil and water bringing state funding and 
their own funding in the medium green and then landowner match in the light green. So you can see uh, those bar graphs really add up a lot taller than they would have if it was just our money brought to the table. Uh, and that means you can get projects done uh, to a higher degree than we would alone. We also get to leverage the landowner relations uh, across municipality boundaries. People have fields all over the county and watershed boundaries and soil and waters relationships. It's also been um, a pretty effective, cost-effective nutrient reduction. Uh, we reduced almost 381 pounds per year in the last is that six years, and that cost averaged out to be 145 pounds for phosphorus, $145 per pound of phosphorus. So, and that will differ practice to practice but that's just an average. To give you an idea of how we go from uh, a landowner who wants help on their property to doing it, get, getting the project done, the landowner will uh, work with soil and water. They'll apply, uh, say there's their lake shore is eroding. Um, soil and water will evaluate if they're eligible for the cost share program. Uh, they will rank applications with district staff based on how much funding we have available in our cost share budget, the environmental benefit, and just the competitiveness of the other projects that are available. So we do that throughout the year um, and, and really um, make sure that we're choosing the best projects to fund. And then depending on uh, wh what type of project it is, it, it is, er, is either approved by the Soil and Water Board or our own. We've approved several this year. Uh, once it's approved by our board or Soil and Waters, we uh, sign a contract with the landowner. They go ahead and work with a contractor to get a design that is then approved by uh, JAA, Job Something Authority, or a licensed engineer. Uh, to make sure that it's a uh, valid design. Uh, they'll go forward with that implementation, build the project, keep the expense records, uh, and then after it's built, soil and water will go out with a, an engineer near and make sure that it is constructed to, to get the benefit that we are paying for. And once they've certified that, then we'll reimburse them for their expenses. This is the general process. And then the general terms are set in what we call the docket. In the upper right corner here is the cover page. These five entities come together and outline um, the general practices that we want to support, the rates for them, uh, and uh, any maximums or limits uh, on repetition how long we want to see that practice uh, agreed to. So there are 27 different practices, and I put contour farming here just as an example. It's one of the more simple ones. Um, and so, for example, someone who did contour farming would get $200 per acre. They couldn't reapply for that, and they would have to keep those contours in place for 10 years. Uh, so those are really agreed upon as standards. But then um, there are also entity-specific provisions. So Scott WMO has their own, and we currently have our own. Uh, the other watershed management organizations don't have any specific provisions that are listed in the current document. This is really our opportunity to reflect our priorities. So you can see in Scott WMOs, they're more focused on sediment erosion than our ours are. Um, it, it will outline the projects that need to come in front of you all for approval. So currently, those projects are any cost share where we contribute greater than 7,500 or any project that is not a type one practice where the cost benefit is greater than 100 pounds. So we pay more than 100 pounds. Uh, $100 per pound of phosphorus. 
And the type one practices are listed on the right there. This is just a list that uh, passed. It came from the district. Uh, this is the only place it's mentioned in the, doc in the docket. So it would be up to us to change this as we saw fit or um, update. I just wanted to provide some context because we are looking at it again this year. Uh, and I noticed these type one practices, which are seemingly our priority practices, are missing quite a few project types with measurable phosphorus benefit. That's in the lower right. I've highlighted all of the ones that are not on that list, uh, which essentially means that we could be um, not fast tracking pro project types that would give us measurable phosphorus benefit. Uh, the ideal way to function with cost share projects is to be as timely as possible. We did miss two prescribed burns this year because we, are the way our board meetings timing worked out, we missed a window. Um, so in the general prioritization process, staff does prioritize and rank uh, pro projects so we make sure we're saving money for the best ones. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to avoid missing the opportunities on these high phosphorus reduction ones. So I just wanted to mention that that's currently how it is. Uh, I haven't had the meeting where we talk about potential updates, but just brainstorming uh, here that a potential way we could update is to create an annual budget uh, for the watershed district that uh, sets aside a bucket for priority practices and other practices. Um, and then in order to maximize timeliness, um, the board would approve any time there is a project greater than 7,500 or any time those other projects are beyond the allocated budget. So that's just one possible way to make sure that we're staying focused on the projects that are gonna align with our mission and direction of our plan, um, but still give some room for, for the other project types that we uh, fund but might not be as high of a priority. So that is, I believe, all I have to, as a primer. More to come. Okay, th <clears throat> thank you, Emily. And uh, this item is listed as discussion only, so if the, any member of the board would like to make a comment on presentation, Manager Boyle. <clears throat> Who's the primary consumer or user or reader of this document? Is it a typical farmer? Is it? Oh, no. <laughs> someone like me? Yeah, well, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Yeah. This is a complex document. Yes. And very detailed. Mm -hmm. So do we have, do we, the sponsoring entities, have someone who kind of takes people by the hand and helps them through the process? And if so, how many in a typical year? Five? Fifty? Last year we completed 21 projects through cost share. So. Okay. Is that how many started? So. Yes. All 21 I think, survived? I think tw yeah, very few were lost. Sometimes there will be a carryover from, you know, a project was started in the year before and then implemented, but it, I believe it was 20 or 21, so okay. one or two. Good. Yeah. And who did you say is? Uh, Soil is and water. Through? Yeah, we'll walk people through the application process individually and they'll uh, work with them to decide what's eligible. In some cases, like shoreline restoration, uh, there are different rates if you put in a certain percentage of riprap so they can work with the people. Well, if you want that, it's going to decrease your cost share. Here's another way you could do it. Um, so that's all. Okay. The, Thank yeah, you. the landowner never sees this document, ideally. <laughs> Any other questions? I just have <clears throat> one. I looked at our budget. It's like uh, 58000 for this year. Is that right for the cost year? So we have in our budget, it looks like we spent 34000 to date. So do we, do we pay once the project's done? Is that what, that how that happens? Or uh, do we upfront the money? 
I'll, I would have to do manager that. Loney. I believe we pay after the project has been yeah. certified. Yep. Basically, the landowner does uh, incur the cost and then requests reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And uh, with our within our budget as well, we have funds set aside just to pay soil and water staff to walk the landowners through that process. And then a portion of our budget is purely to pay for the cost share itself. Okay. So our budget has two components <coughs> to it. Part of it is just compensating soil and water to administer the program for us. Mm -hmm. And then, then the actual literal cost of the projects that are implemented. But I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Joni, that, that soil and water will invoice us when um, we have signed a contract with the landowner so we encumber those funds and don't um, commit them to another yeah. project. That is, that is correct. You <coughs> correct, Emily, yes. They do bill us once that fund is, that project is encumbered. I guess my next question is, do we see a lot more projects being finalized by the end of the year, or are we gonna be under budget, or? I mean, we're at 34,000, so. We do expect to be under budget this year, uh, but there will be years uh, where a lot comes at the end because we're sure. saving money to make sure we're not spending it before a high priority right. comes. I saw that in your graph, that it, it fluctuates, mm -hmm. especially in 2020, I think, with COVID and that, so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Emily, we're going to move on to the treasurer's report with Manager Morkenberg. Thank you, President Loney. Um, financially, the district is in good condition. Um, in uh, December, we will, like in the last few months here, we'll see more bills coming in from uh, contractors, uh, so we will spend more money there uh, historically and this year. In December, we will also be committing uh, 2003 budgeted funds for specific priorities as well, and uh, as an example, future alum treatment and uh, some upper watershed district projects. Um, and given the fact that this is the end of the third quarter, we have uh, included a cost summary uh, sheet. And, uh, and at that uh, cost summary sheet, you can, you can see how it's sort of breaking out, how uh, we have larger consulting fees, uh, how much that compares to other operating expenses. Any questions? Any questions for on the treasurer's report? It looks we're we're doing well. Looks good. No big expenditures, but we hope to have some someday. Okay, um, we're going to move on. I think Joni, you have a quarterly financial report that you do. Is that and five point two? It says balance sheet cost analysis. Is all right, President Loney, uh, as, as Manager Morkenberg uh, explained, uh, because it is the end of the third quarter, we, too have, we do have two additional uh, pieces of financial information that we put into the board packet, one being the, the balance sheet, um, and the second uh, is really, once again, that uh, cost analysis. Um, I do also, next month, I will be making a, my quarterly statement on our investment um, opportunities. But once again, with the balance sheet, uh, it does show that, uh, you know, we have about, about $140,000 of liabilities where we're holding funds associated uh, with permit securities and, and deposits. Um, and once again, uh, we are a staff working to um, some of those might be a little dated and trying to figure out who those owners of those properties are. So to return some of those funds. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to add some more comments to that item or not. So anyway, that's a good report. Um, moving on to item 6.0 consent agenda, which is meeting minutes for September 12th, 2023 board workshop meeting minutes, September 12th, 2023 board meeting meeting minutes, July 27th, 2023 CAC meeting, 
in the claims list and bank purchase card expenditure summary. So I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Manager Burnett. Second. Second by Manager Tofanelli. Um, there's no discussion on uh, consent. Anyway, all in favor say aye. 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 Oh, it carries, 5-0. Oh. All right, I'm gonna have Manager Boyles read our upcoming meeting and event schedule. We have six upcoming meetings of great interest. First is the clean water cleanup event, Saturday, October 28th, from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. at Sandpoint Beach. All are welcome to give us a hand to keep our, our waters and shorelines uh, pristine. The PLOC cooperators, Prior Lake Outlet Channel cooperators, uh, will be meeting on Thursday, November 9th, uh, at noon at Prior Lake City Hall in Parkview Conference Room, just adjacent to the City Council Chambers. There will be a joint Spring Lake Township, Prior Lake, uh, Spring Lake Watershed District meeting on the draft Fish Lake Management Plan update on Thursday, November 14th at 3 p.m. again here at Prior Lake City Hall in the Parkview Conference Room. The Board of Managers on November 14th, that's a Tuesday, at 4 p.m. will conduct their manager's workshop for the month of November, again in Parkview Conference Room, followed at 6 p.m. by the Board of Managers meeting same night, Tuesday, November 14th, in these August council chambers. Finally, the community, is it Community Action Committee or is it Citizen Action? Citizen Action Committee, I apologize. We'll meet this uh, meet on Thursday, December 7th, 6 p.m. here again at City Hall. That meeting location, however, is in Wagon Bridge Conference Room, which is the largest conference room on the lower, lower level of the building. And those are the meetings for November and December. Thank you, Frank. Uh, one question I had, it was listed uh, our joint meeting with the township is on Thursday, November 14th, but is it really Tuesday? That's correct, it's Tuesday, just before the board workshop. Okay. Oh, I failed the test. Well, you <laughs> actually got the date right, but the day wrong. But do, you read exactly what was printed. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion by Manager Topanelli. Second. Second by Manager Boyle. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carried 5-0. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned. <laughs>